Hello there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right and a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Thank you, Scott. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome aboard Must Read Alaska, coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. We have a great show for you today, but brr, baby, it is cold outside. I just was remembering today, John, do you remember a couple of years ago when that song was canceled off the radios around Christmas because they said it was sexist? It was like, baby, it's cold outside. Do you remember that song? And they all canceled it off the radio because of this Me Too kind of stuff that was going on, date rape warning bells going off on everybody's heads. And I mean, it was just like a classic from 1944. And yet all of a sudden that song, you never hear it anymore. Cancel culture, before cancel culture was cool, it got cancel culture. It is so canceled. And it, remember it, that one line and it says, uh, hey, what's in this drink? And then the answer is no. And so uh, now I was just thinking about, uh, you know, what's going on in Alaska today with, your, with our former attorney general. And we're going to talk about that today. But we're going to talk about a lot of things. Um, but first, welcome to the Must Read Alaska show, everybody. Those we're, we're not in those simpler days. We're in really complicated times now, but we are a reader driven and listener driven conservative news project about Alaska for Alaskans, and we keep the mainstream media on their toes. So I'm Suzanne Downing, and I'm joined by John Quick. We've got so much going on in Alaska where it's eight degrees below zero in Fairbanks, but 38 degrees above zero in Ketchikan. They're, they're starting to see the, the little daffodils pop through. And uh, we're kind of going into a cold spell in Anchorage, but what's going on over there in Kenai? Well, Suzanne, John, quick here. Kenai Peninsula is rocking and rolling. We, uh, it is very cold here. Uh, but just last week, uh, the Kenai Peninsula Borough School District announced the new superintendent, a gentleman named Clayton Holland. It's a, it's a, uh, it's the buzz out here on the peninsula. And uh, there was three folks in the running for the new superintendent slot, and he got it. And this will be the third superintendent that the school district has had in roughly three years. And Ooh. so uh, Clayton is a guy that's been in the school district in various rule, roles for quite some time now. Uh, the two other candidates were out, out of district candidates. Uh, one was a doctor and one was about to be a doctor. And- You mean like uh, a medical doctor or like one of those just PhD doctors? Like a PhD doctor. Both oh, okay. of them I think had their doctorates in education or something like that. And uh, you know, Nothing against Clayton. He's a really nice guy. I know him. Um, he cares about the kids. He cares about the teachers and all that kind of stuff. But basically, he's coming through the system. And it's going to probably be the same old, same old stuff that the parents of the Kenai Peninsula Borough have been experiencing over the last year and a half. Uh, my hope is that Clayton uh, is able to listen to parents because that has not happened with our current superintendent. In fact, he has made it very clear that he won't listen to parents who have anything uh, that, that is against what he thinks. And so I would say a good first step out of the gate would be to have an open dialogue and open discussion with parents who uh, have pulled their students in the last nine months for lack of uh, and failed leadership in the district. So, uh, you know, I want to be optimistic, but I think the proof will be in the pudding. I hope that we don't see four superintendents in four years. I hope, I really hope that he is successful, uh, but the proof again will be in the pudding and, and how much effort he puts towards getting back these conservative parents who have felt like they've been pushed outside of the fringe of anything where their opinion would matter. Mm, interesting. Well, you know, uh, three uh, superintendents in three years is kind of a lot. I gotta say the average superintendent in America typically lasts only about five years. It is a, it's a job that pays a lot of money because there's only one per town typically, one superintendent. So 
of, of schools per town. So if you lose your job as superintendent, you got to move to a new town. And so it's, it's a kind of a costly lifestyle. It's not like you can go and work from one store and then work at another. It's a really costly thing to pull up your stakes and move to a new town. But in this case, this guy's not having to move to a new town. It reminds me of uh, Haynes, Alaska. They've gone through city managers just about the same rate. And it's, um, it, it just seems to be part of their culture to not be picking or accepting their city managers in any way, shape, or form. So hopefully Clayton Holland will be the right chemistry for, for the district since he kind of was raised in the district. You can't say he doesn't know it, right? He knows the district. Yep. And, you know, the, the uh, schools just opened up here. Uh, I think today was the day they opened up 7th through 12th grade. And so that'll mean all grades K through 12th will be open to in-person learning. And I just find it I'm, I'm ecstatic that that's happening, but I also find it humorous that us conservatives knew that, God forbid, when Trump lost, that very soon afterwards, like magically, everything would just start opening again. And we, we see it from New York to Alaska. Somehow, you know, the worst virus in the world has, it's, it's finally okay to open now that Trump's not president. Oh, absolutely. I was looking at a uh, headline in the New York Times today. Infections aren't what matters. The news about vaccines continues to be excellent, and the public discussion of it continues to be more negative than facts warrant. Oh, really? I mean, seriously, more negative than facts warrant? It's like, that's the New York <laughs> Times for you. Oh, my gosh. So, I, to, you know, we, you and I were talking about something that's happening in the silver market, and, and I wanted you to, to fill in our listeners about that before we get into our topics of the day. What went on with silver today? That's huge. So there's, if for those of you who haven't maybe paid attention, I would encourage you to go Google uh, Wall Street Bets. It's a Reddit forum who's kind of been all over the map this last couple of weeks. And one of the things that they've kind of honed into was silver uh, today. And silver climbed 9.3% to 2940 uh, for futures. And uh, that's the biggest percentage jump since March of 2009. And, and really, this is very, very interesting because over the last week, they did something similar. This group, this Reddit group, Wall Street Bets, did something similar with GameStop shares. Now, for those of you that don't know what GameStop is, it's basically a on the verge of bankruptcy uh, a video game store. They got literally only like 50 stores around the whole US. They've shuttered their doors to probably 80% of their physical locations over the last several years. And this group, this Reddit group, along with some other kind of fringe groups, thought, you know, let's try to beat these hedge fund managers, these Wall Street elites at their own game, and let's shore up GameStop and see how high we can uh, make GameStop do a run for. And a lot of hedge fund managers lost their pants on this because what they had is they had what are called puts or calls, which are basically short bets, betting that a stock would... Uh, would go under a certain price. So a lot of these hedge fund managers had a short-term bet that GameStop would actually keep falling because it looked like it was on the verge of bankruptcy and going away. And they lost a ton of money because these these essentially what are bets, but they're stock plays. You only have to buy them for like a dollar or two dollars, but you can lose a ton of money. Uh, the simplest oh, yeah. way I've ever had it explained to me is like if you're betting on a horse, and the horse, let's say, has a 19 to 1, you know, percentage of losing or winning and, you know, 19 to 1 odds of winning and you win and you're going to win big, right? Because it was 19 to 1. Well, if you do these short stock investments called puts or calls, you're on the hook if you lose 19 to 1. And so if, if you bet that the stock is going to go down and the stock actually goes up, you are on the, you're on the hook for a lot of money. And some people lost hundreds of millions of dollars on just GameStop, which is sad in some regards, but it also goes to show you that, you know, the game is rigged with a bunch of folks at the top that know how these stocks are going to go. Oh, and Wall Street cool. Bets has thrown a curveball at everybody, and I love it. Yep, yep, yep. It's very interesting to watch, as Nancy Pelosi would say, or she did say, 
Oh, it's very interesting. Yes, it is interesting. <laughs> the whole thing's rigged. And I'll tell you what, um, Robin Hood, the app that was supposed to be for the little guy, boy, when push came to shove, they were right there for the hedge funds. They, they were lock, stock, and barrel all, all in to, to protect them. Well, listen, we're going to talk about some other things today, and, and I want to get to them. I want everybody to know so we've, we've got some breaking news coming about Anwar, and so I just want you to stand by a little bit later in the show. But we're going to talk about a couple of other things first, but please stick around for this. You're going to want to hear this. First of all, we're going to talk about the changeover in the attorney general again, and that kind of gets back to our... Uh, <laughs> I'm saying as a baby, it's cold outside. It's really cold outside for Ed Snippen, who was our attorney general designee for a few minutes there. We'll talk about the of course, house organization and uh, lack of organization. And then we'll just uh, briefly talk about assembly members, Chris Constant and Forrest Dunbar, and the, then the interesting emails that went back and forth between those two guys, what they said about their constituents and what that tells us about what they think about the public. But first of all, everybody, please go to mustreadalaska.com and hit the sign up button for our newsletter and make sure that you are getting our Monday, Wednesday, Friday newsletter and all of our uh, club MRAC legislative bulletins that we are getting out the, during the rest of the week. It's a great product. And it's, it's, you know, lobbyists have this kind of inside information. This is for the rest of us. So I hope you sign up at mustreadalaska.com. Well, Alaska is out yet another attorney general. You know, at first it was Kevin Clarkson and he was sending way too many texts, as you'll remember, to an underling employee in the governor's office. And, you know, it's hard to say they were entirely appropriate. They weren't illegal, really. They were just in poor taste and they did make her feel uncomfortable. And um, after a while, she wanted to put an end to it. And then, of course, what she did was take it to the recall Dunleavy people and, um, and leak it to them. And then the uh, former attorney general decided he had better quit, and he did. That, that was a good thing. And now there's a, there's a still an investigation going on on that one, I believe, to determine you know just what was Kevin Clarkson doing, texting um, you know a lower level employee at, in the way that he was. These are the this, you know the, the attorney general is the top law officer in the state, and their reputation has to be beyond reproach. And when I think say beyond reproach. I like to think of sort of the Avram Gross standard, which was back in the Hammond administration. Now, you are too young to remember this, <laughs> but if those, those who are listening who, are, who were around back in the day in the 70s, they will remember that Av Gross was the long-haired hippie attorney general, ended up being um, um, you know, Al Gross's dad. Uh, Al Gross ran for Senate and lost. But Av Gross, uh, he died in 2018. But boy, I tell you, he was a notorious drug user. Now, I don't want to slander his good name. So I'm not going to say he was an illegal drug user. I'm just going to say he was a drug user. And um, But back in those days, uh, let me tell you, the cocaine, just it just flowed in Alaska, just as <laughs> much as the oil flowed. The cocaine flowed up and the oil flowed out. And you know there was just a lot of drugs in the in the 70s. It was a fast, fast life in Alaska. And let me tell you, he was right there in the middle of it. But our, that way, that was our top law officer, and he lasted all eight years through the Hammond administration. Well, this time it's a nominee who has not been confirmed. He's been he's been our acting um, attorney general. He, he needed to face confirmation by the House and Senate, but. He's been with the department for 20 plus years. He worked for Democrats, he worked for Republicans, he worked for that slippery guy named Bill Walker who didn't know what he was. Ed Sniffin, as it turned out, had a, a sort of a relationship way, way in the way back machine with a young lady who was 17 at the time at West High School. And she was on the high school litigation team and he was a coach, you know, the legal coach for the team. He was the lawyer coaching that team and he was 27, she was 17. And this was back in the 90s. but. She's now 47, he's 57, and she decided to just go ahead and Kavanaugh this guy uh, as he was making his way into the role of attorney general. She didn't call the governor's office and, and talk to anybody there. She didn't talk to uh, anybody in law enforcement. What she did is she called the media. She went directly to the newspaper. And so that's how uh, Ed Sneepen went from being the nominee for the top law job to probably losing his license to practice law in our state. And he could even face some jail time, quite honestly, because really 17 and, and 27, they passed a law after this happened. It, it was the Satch Carlson. I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but after a, a teacher up in Anchorage got caught with a, a, some, a young lady, 
they passed a law saying you can't do that. You can't, there was no law at the time that said it was illegal, but they made it illegal that if you have a, a power relationship, so you're a coach, you're a counselor, you're, you're a teacher of some sort, you can't have a relationship with a minor. And, um, and this would, this, if this relationship indeed happened, as this woman says it does, back in 1993, it would be covered by that law. And I don't think that there is a statute of limitations on that. Now, I, I wrote about the story, John. You saw that I wrote about it. I said it was a fling. Yep, it was a fling. She, she kind of flung herself on him, it looks like, maybe. But, um, but she was an underage, and he, and he should have known better. And, uh, and eventually, they ended up sharing the same address. I don't know if they lived together, but they, they apparently shared the same address after she turned 18. So not really sure all of the allegations, but boy, I tell you, the, the ADN, and it's their story, and it's uh, ProPublica's story, they believe her side of it, which is that he gave her alcohol, and then things kind of went from there. Now, I'm really sad for all these people. I'm sad for her. I'm sad because, you know, that's kind of a lot. There's also a lot to go through what she's going through even now, but I'm sad for Ed Sniff and his career is over. I'm sad for their families, and what a mess. Um, but, I feel like if she had just not wanted to destroy him, she could have gone to the chief of staff and said, you need to withdraw his name because I have this history with him and um, he needs to resign and blah, blah, blah. But she went to the, to the journalists. She went for revenge journalism. And that's just looking to destroy people publicly, shame them forever. And um, so it's kind of interesting. Um, we'll be watching it. Let's talk a little bit um, about the House organization, John. I know that you are dying for to, for me to tell you everything that I know <laughs> that's going on, right? Yep. You know, the one thing I would say about the 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 current thing that's happening with the former now, I guess, Attorney General or Acting Attorney General, is I want to encourage folks that are writing about this, these pro publica folks, and you know, the ADN. Whatever happened to Epstein, right? <laughs> this guy, like, literally, was the bi world's biggest predator of yeah. in the history of predators. <laughs> and <laughs> they not only that was Epstein uh, had cameras on, in his house twenty four seven, filming everybody that came in and out of his house. All Where's these those, politicians, where is that footage? all these celebrities, uh, and where is the coverage on this guy? Is it because he is a uh, friend of the left that they refuse to do any sort of coverage on this guy or that that they have you know high folks and with big political names on the left that they don't want to put and throw you know under the bus it just seems crazy to me that there's this guy that is a professed child predator the biggest one in the entire world that i know of that had this ring of craziness happening and and it's just nothing happens i you know yeah, I've never yeah. seen anybody in the Anchorage Daily News or anybody give two hoots about what this guy was doing and uh, text messages, you know, with the former attorney general, they're inappropriate. It was, you know, somebody who worked for him. This for that matter, for that matter, what about the Lincoln Project? You got the co-founder of the Lincoln Project who apparently was grooming young men. And you never hear about that in the mainstream media. They've completely ignored that. So we, we do have a double standard in the media, but of course, um, that's, that's just the world we live in. And uh, when, that's the world we kind of fight every day. We fight on behalf of the rest of us who um, are not part of that inner circle, that inner club of journalists who are only telling one side of the story. Say, so, I want to talk about the House So we'd love to hear about Epstein, folks. <laughs> yep. Okay. Well, before we hear talk about Epstein, let's talk about the House organization because we're going to run out of, of a freeway a runway here in a minute. Um, you know, today the uh, the House met for about ten minutes, and Kevin Meyer, our Lieutenant Governor, was presiding, and he asked if there were any uh, nominations for Speaker Pro Tem. That's the person who just ceremonially takes the gavel and tries to conduct a little bit of business while you come up with a speaker. Well, they. Uh, only got a nomination from the Republican side. Now, uh, last week, the Republicans nominated Bart LeBon. They, they, they nominated him the week before. Bart LeBon is a Fairbanks Republican. And a few years ago, uh, he joined the Democrats and, and went with Democrat majority. So they thought, well, you know, he could be Speaker Pro Tem and they'll like him well enough because he caucused with them. So they should like him. But they said no. 2020 vote was, they, they wouldn't accept him. They put Bart LeBon up twice. 
the Democrats wouldn't accept him. Today, Bart LeBon nominated Laddie Shaw. Laddie Shaw is like the most loved person in the legislature. He is such a good guy. Vietnam vet. Um, he's a, a Navy SEAL, former Navy SEAL. He was a director of veterans for the, the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. And he he's just doesn't have any natural enemies, really, except for Kathy um, Giesel, who hated him for some reason, couldn't figure out why. But she's gone. And everybody else really likes Laddie. Laddie's a great guy. He likes to solve problems. In fact, he's even co-sponsored some legislation with Democrats in the past. He's a good guy. But 2020 vote, no, the Democrats won't take him. And yet they did not offer a name of their own. They did not offer a name for speaker. And they just simply voted for the third time. They voted down the nominee from the Republicans. It's really embarrassing for Democrats to be so sort of weak, but they're playing the waiting game because in the past, eventually they find a weakling amongst the sheep and they bring that person over. And that's what they've done in the past. We'll see if it works. Yeah. If, um, you know, I think folks are not expecting much. Uh, the conservatives out here know that if you give these folks an inch, they're going to want a mile. And I want to give props to the Republicans for continuing to uh, throw out names that, you know, by all realistic standpoints, sh should be getting 21 votes. Uh, but the Democrats refuse to work for the better good of the state. And uh, they will continue to do that until, like you said, they have some sort of a in or an angle or a, a or, game to play. Or dirt and, on uh, somebody, you know? Or dirt on somebody. <laughs> And I, I think uh, the average Alaskan is just sick and tired of this political nonsense. And they, they want to see a state move forward. They want to see balanced budgets. They want to see folks working together. And, and they, they want to see a person elected as the Speaker of the House. And uh, well, they, you know, also, we are in a state of emergency still. We still do have a pretty big problem. We've got a, a virus that is, you know, it does make people really sick and some people die from it. And so we, we have had an outstanding response, really, in general. From the state level, we've had a pretty good response in terms of making sure our hospitals and our, our clinics were not overwhelmed. We never saw them overwhelmed, really. We always had capacity, and I think the state's done a good job, but but this is no time to just muck around. It's time for the, the Democrats to um, to stop playing games and to move this thing forward. And, and I've got to call out specifically, uh, you know, Louise Stutes, who's a Republican who caucuses with the Democrats. I don't know, you know, what is she thinking? What does she think really that we're going to get a better result with the Democrats in charge? I, I just don't think so, but it is kind of a shame. Now, let's talk about um, Chris Constant and Forrest Dunbar. We're going to head into this Anchorage politics a little bit. Forrest Dunbar is running for mayor. And Chris Constant, of course, is on the assembly. And he's, he's very known for, very much known for his foul mouth. Well, we have a local activist. This guy was not an activist until he started seeing what was going on in City Hall. And he just decided that things were nuts. And he, he did a records request. And he asked for all the records for... Uh, emails between Forrest Dunbar and Chris Constant. And boy, did he get a treasure trove. And so if you look at the story on Must Read Alaska, and I hope you do, you'll see that we've got a story about how Forrest Dunbar admits in these emails back and forth with, with Chris Constant that they were actually, op they were operating a big racket to shame the pastors in Anchorage into writing letters supporting this thing that we call the homeless industrial complex because it's really, a, it's really a build it and they will come kind of a situation where we offer a whole bunch of housing, a whole bunch of treatment, and we're just going to become a big homeless industrial system here in Anchorage. And so the, the pastors that were quiet were getting harassed by these guys. And this email train, it really shows exactly what they were up to. Another email that was released in this public records request showed that they were completely being disrespectful of the Save Anchorage group. And they basically said, you know, I don't know why we even have to respond to these people. These are Save Anchorage people. They just don't even count. And that's a really big group of people. I mean, there's like 9,000 people in that group. It's a big group. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, this just shows their true colors. These two folks on the assembly, Dunbar and Constant, they have no respect for the conservative. Zero respect. And not only that, is they entered into 
a strategy together on their own private emails because they thought they could get away with it and they thought nobody would see it because it's their own private emails. They obviously did not use their uh, city emails. They used their private emails for a reason and they had a strategy for a reason. And this strategy they labeled as the shame campaign. They had a shame campaign going on to Christian pastors mm -hmm. to force them to come around and be okay with this plan that they had. Now, this is, uh, this is a very amazing, perfect example of how the average citizen can get involved in Anchorage. This, this guy that did the public information request, like you said, you know, probably hadn't had too much to do with politics before, but Nothing. he stuck his, stuck his head out and he, and he made a public information request. And if, if you're listening here today, I would start to think about how you can get involved in not only just the Anchorage race, but races ar around your uh, local municipality or your local borough. And there are ways to get involved without actually running. And a lot of these folks, like Forrest, are operating on their own private emails, their own private text messages, trying to elude the public uh, scrutiny, in scrutiny yeah. of having to come forward with what they're doing on public emails and pr public servers and their public internet browsers because they think they can get away with it. Well, it turns out you can't. And I can tell you uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, when I was the chief of staff for the borough, I had to hand my phone over to the borough attorney because we have a, we had a public information request on every single text message that the mayor and I had sent together, every oh, text yeah. message. So I had to literally give them my phone and they had to go through thousands and thousands and thousands of text messages. Mm -hmm. Now, luckily, not a single one of them were anything to write home about, but everything is public when you're a public, uh, when you're elected public official. And I hope that this sheds a glimpse of light about how much these folks care about the conservatives in Anchorage, which is basically none. And they not only not care about them, but they are engaged in a strategy to shame them into coming along board with their plan. And mm -hmm. this is just stuff that the Republicans don't do. And this is why I really appreciate conservatives because we will nine times out of 10, agree to disagree and then move on. Yeah. These folks will agree, will agree to wanting to get their way until they will do everything they can, including shaming local pastors to get their way. And it's very unfortunate. It's very sad. I would encourage both of these folks to, uh, to apologize, to pull out of running for the mayor. Uh, this is not somebody who we, lead, who we need leading the city of Anchorage. This is somebody who we need going through maybe an ethics training and and thinking about uh, how their behavior is detrimental to the city. So uh, this uh, this person who got these uh, emails between these two guys, he got a bunch of them more. He's got a big trove of them. And he sent me a few more and they, they're they really heavily redacted. So anything that involves uh, AO66, the purchase of all those uh, buildings, anything involved with, uh, with closing down the uh, the assembly meetings last year, they've redacted it all. They basically gave the emails over, but they've all been redacted. So you can't really see what they say. It's all just blacked out. And uh, that's kind of interesting to that. They decided that they could redact that. There's absolutely no reason why they should be able to redact this the uh, discussion about uh, closing the assembly chambers to the public. And uh, so I think we're gonna see some more about that, about whether or not that was a legal redaction. That might end up going to court. And listen, I, I've got some breaking news for us. Um, I, I just found out today that uh, the Democrats in Washington in the House have put in a sort of an Anwar repeal. So you remember how the, one of the first things that uh, President Trump did was to sign an opening of Anwar and to get those leases out? Well, there's an Anwar repeal. This is exactly what we were hoping wouldn't happen. But there's, uh, it's coming out of the House Natural Resources Committee, this, uh, this Representative Grijalda from, from Arizona and all the crazies over in the House. And what it is, is it's tucked into this, to this package, which says uh, they are going to submit changes in law within this jurisdiction to increase the deficit by not more than $1 billion for the fiscal years of 2021 20, through 2030. That was how we got ANWAR, is that we said, 
you know, we'll get ANWR in and that will reduce our deficit. So now that they're, what they're doing is they're backing that out. This is gonna go over to the Senate and in the Senate, it will go into the Senate Natural Resources Committee where we have, uh, luckily we have, you know, Senator Lisa Murkowski over in the Senate and she knows Joe Manchin, who's now taking over as the Senate Natural Resources Committee chair. She knows him real well. They have a great working relationship and hopefully we will see it killed there, that, that, that part of this uh, bill crossed out. Manchin is our only hope really for getting it killed because he's, uh, he's chair of this committee. But I tell you, this is what, uh, this is what they're gonna do to us if they can. They will absolutely destroy our state because, well, they're in charge. We've, you know, our, the Americans voted for them. And uh, I'm, I just think that th there's gonna be a big story here. I'll probably work on this story tomorrow, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, I'll get it out because this will show up in the Senate tomorrow and there'll be some sort of a, a bill on it uh, that there'll be a vote on it at some point. So I just want everybody to be aware of it. I'm just seeing the language now. I've got a, a, a screen grab of the actual language from the Committee of Natural Resources, the amount, and it is exactly what we needed from um, from ANWR to help reduce our budget deficit. I don't know where they're going to come up with the money. We've got such a big, what, I mean, what is, that, what is our national debt? It's like $28 trillion now, something like that. Yeah. And, you know, I, basically anything that comes out of the uh, Biden administration in layman's terms is we hate Alaska is pretty much how it boils down to. We don't like oil jobs. We don't like anything that has to do with oil production and, uh, folks that are sitting in their houses and you voted for Biden and maybe you're a moderate or maybe you're a conservative that hated Trump, Biden's administration's goal is to shut down Alaska and to make it a postcard and to make it a place where you can go fishing. And unfortunately, that's nice for high fives and hugs, but it doesn't pay anybody's freaking bills. Oops, said freaking. Yep, yep, there you go again. Edit that one yep, out. Yeah, we had, yeah, that one, that one worked. Uh, we've had this discussion, now, haven't we? Well, listen, um, that's going to be a wrap for today's show. That is a great way to end this show. Um, check out more stories at mustrealaska.com, especially when I start writing about this, this reconciliation bill that's going to make its way to the Senate tomorrow. And I just want to thank you for being my co-host, John Quick, and I and thank you, Scott Levesque, for producing this. If you're a supporter of Must Read Alaska, I want to thank you too. It makes this all possible. We've got a website. We've got an app. you got to get that app. We've got uh, newsletters that go out every day. We've got this podcast and we've got a YouTube channel and some other things on other social media platforms. And that's what it takes to fight against the big blue wave of activist liberal media. So until next week, we are signing off from somewhere in Alaska. <laughs>